Much of the open ocean is referred to as a biological desert. The vast majority of the sea is hundreds or thousands of kilometers from land, and is mostly empty water, poor in nutrients, and therefore containing little diversity in life forms. The parts of the sea we know and love, the coral reefs full of schools of colorful fish, or the channels between islands where dolphins and whales and sea turtles all spend time, make up just a tiny percentage of the ocean. For a long time, the only thing we were certain populated the open ocean in huge numbers was something of our own making, plastic. Sometimes these garbage debris fields are so concentrated that they get their own names, like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Garbage vortexes like this are a nasty testament to the state of our modern world, and we can't help but think of them with sadness and disgust and a desire for somebody to scoop it all up. But the way we think about ocean garbage patches may actually be kind of wrong. I know when I first heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, I pictured a dense, singular, floating barge of trash. But really, the metric F-load of trash that's out there is more like a smattering of individual garbage pieces over a large area. And much to everyone's surprise, scientists have discovered that ocean garbage patches are not at all devoid of life. It turns out that an entire class of organisms lives their entire lives among the trash, and in great numbers. And these creatures look nothing like almost any other animal. Forget fins and tails and glittering scales. These jellyfish, snails, barnacles, hydrozoans, and nudibranchs belong to a class of their own, with fantastic and beautiful adaptations to their environment. These floating organisms live on the surface of the water and go wherever the wind and ocean currents take them. They come in dazzling shades of blue and purple, helping them blend into the surface of the water. And each has its own special trick for surviving their unique environment an environment which is a thin sliver of water and air that's only about one meter in thickness. All of these organisms live right alongside the plastic, collected in gyres by the very same forces that sweep our trash into certain parts of the ocean. Which means whenever we try to collect all that trash, we're also inadvertently sweeping away and killing hundreds or even thousands of unique organisms. So what are we supposed to do? Is there a way to clean up the ocean without killing all of these incredible life forms? Or do we simply just leave all that trash? How important to the health of the overall ocean are these colorful floating creatures? And what other mysteries might they still hold? Even under the calmest conditions, oceans are never completely still. Ocean gyres are a perfect example of this. There are five major gyres found across the planet, in the North and South Pacific, North and South Atlantic, and in the Indian Ocean. They're created by the spinning rotation of the planet, the blowing wind, and the placement of land masses. And there are plenty of smaller gyres all over the oceans too. The Sargasso Sea is located in the Atlantic, but has its own ecosystem and own boundaries defined by winds and currents. It's also filled with sargassum, an algae that experiences its entire life on the ocean surface rather than needing to reproduce attached to the sea floor. That algae is a hugely important habitat for numerous species, from sea turtles to eels. But the largest gyre of all is the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre, and it couldn't be more different from the Sargasso Sea. For a long time, it was thought to be largely devoid of life, being so far from the coastline. But in the 1950s, a Soviet research vessel crisscrossed the Pacific, taking samples along the way, and discovered something astonishing. The surface of the ocean was filled with life, creatures that floated and bobbed, letting the wind and waves take them everywhere. These organisms were named Neustin, a word that plays on plankton combined with the Greek neustos for swimming. Some neustonic life forms only come to the surface for certain stages of their life cycle, like fish larvae, 
but obligate Newston spend their whole lives in the thin space between sea and sky. They're moved by the same forces that shape the ocean gyres. But since the 1950s, there's also been a new element added to the mix. Plastic. Annual plastic production is close to 400 million metric tons, and each year, several million tons of that plastic enters the ocean. A lot of that trash gets caught around the coastlines or in rivers, but the pieces that do get swept out to the open ocean are usually buoyant, and become subject to the same forces that move the neustonic creatures around. Which means that where there are these organisms, there's probably also trash. Yet, trying to study these life forms and figuring out just how much plastic has made it into the gyre is extremely difficult logistically. The Pacific Ocean is enormous, and boats have to travel slowly to collect samples. There's just a lot we don't know yet. What we do know is that these life forms are incredibly strange and unique. One of the most iconic members of the Neustan family is the siphonophore Physalia physalis, more commonly known as the Portuguese man o' war. They're infamous for their incredibly painful sting, which in rare cases can cause cardiac arrest. Though it may appear similar to a jellyfish, the man o' war is actually a colonial hydrozoan. While it looks like a single organism, it's made up of individuals who serve specific purposes and work together as a collective unit. For Physalia, those main units are the pneumatophore, an air sac filled with oxygen and carbon dioxide that acts as a sail, the tentacle polyp used to sting and capture prey, the feeding polyp that digests food, and the reproductive structure. And although it has to rely on the motion of wind and water to transport it from place to place, the Portuguese man o' war is still a formidable hunter. Its stinging tentacles can extend multiple meters below the sea, and it feasts on fish that swim into those tentacles and get stung to death. But just because it has some good strategies for catching mobile prey doesn't mean Physalia is safe from other predators. In fact, it's the favored food of a species so bizarre it barely looks real, a nudibranch known as the blue sea dragon. Glaucus atlanticus and its relatives might look like harmless and dazzling little sea slugs, but they're actually armed with an incredible weapon, stingers that they steal from the Portuguese man o' war. Rebecca Helm, an environmental scientist who specializes in neustonic life forms, has had first-hand experience with blue sea dragons and says they need to be handled with care. In general, on a large scale, they'll eat a tentacle. And within the tentacle, there are special cells that are shaped like eggs that contain the hypodermic needle that the man war uses to deliver venom. So when they eat a tentacle, they have to somehow, right, like dig out these stinging cells, like digging out a cherry pit. And then in their gut, there are branches all the way up to the surface of their skin. And so each little cell gets redirected in their digestive tract up to their skin, unfired still, somehow, somehow, and we really have no idea. Because you can fire those tentacles with the briefest touch, and somehow they're able to move them through their digestive tract up to the surface of their skin through these really cool canals, um, unfired, just waiting there for someone, usually <laughs> you know, a scientist or a curious person, to touch them, and then that's it. But the blue sea dragon doesn't have any method of moving itself either. Its ability to float comes from the bubble of air that it swallows and holds in its stomach. Instead of seeking out prey, it has to wait for the ocean currents to bring it in direct contact with the hydrozoan. And then it employs another trick. They're called serrata, but they look like hands and they're coming off the side of their body and they actually use them like little hands to grab things. And it's so neat to see them, you know, interact with their environment and try to catch food. And, and they truly can't swim. They have no control over where they go and what they do. So they just kind of relax and sit in the sun. And when something bumps into them, it's like they're so fast. Their tail is prehensile, so they can wrap onto things with their tail and sort of hold on to multiple things at once and just kind of eat them one at a time. 
They're really, really cool. But the blue sea dragon isn't the only creature that eats Portuguese man o' wars. So do the violet snails, Janthina Janthina, which also can't swim. These snails have to create bubble rafts from their own mucus just to stay afloat, and must be extremely careful when they're consuming prey. If the violet snails eat too much of their prey and don't have a stable raft of bubbles, both prey and predator will sink. The ability to stay afloat and be carried by wind and waves is critical for these strange organisms. Just as the Portuguese man o' war relies on its pneumatophor to stay on the ocean's surface, a hydrozoan called Valella Valella, aka the by the wind sailor, has a dorsal fin protruding from its body to help it catch the breeze. But sometimes that little sail can backfire. These organisms are regularly seen on coastlines around the world after mass stranding events. When the wind switches to blowing towards the shore, hundreds and even thousands of these cnidarians can end up on the beach. And the problem might be getting worse for them as water temperature warms, even in winter. Dangerous as plastic is for many marine species, you know, at the end of the day, the biggest threat to marine life, no matter where you go in the ocean, is, is our changing climate and the unpredictability of that. And, and organisms that live at the surface, they're right there. They are the front line um, for the ocean. Everything that happens in the ocean has to go through the surface of the ocean. And so temperature changes, changes in weather patterns, they're going to experience it before any other creatures in the sea. And the harm of these man-made problems can be strange and unpredictable. For example, floating plastic doesn't just enter their environment and make a mess. Sometimes it also brings unexpected visitors. Historically, a very small number of organisms could travel large distances over the oceans on driftwood, colonizing new islands or even continents. But it was rare, because driftwood decays pretty rapidly. But today, plastic presents an optimal floating surface, and organisms that were previously limited to shorelines are now traveling out to the open ocean and doing well enough that they can reproduce and establish permanent colonies floating out at sea. One major example of this was when the massive tsunami that hit eastern Japan in 2011 resulted in 4.5 million tons of debris getting washed out to sea almost instantly. By 2017, more than 100,000 pieces of debris from that tsunami had landed in North America, and 381 Japanese coastal species came with it, still alive. These were mainly little invertebrates, things like mussels, arthropods, cnidarians, and bryozoans. So it's not like Japanese macaques were riding the plastic trash all the way from their home to the Hawaiian Islands. But the fact that some of these organisms managed to survive a very long trip over open ocean, and in some cases went through a reproductive cycle in an environment far different from their own, suggests that they may be able to establish new populations at sea. And that could have unexpected consequences. Are they invasive species that will hurt the Neustin? Will they reshape the food webs in unexpected ways? Will they help clean up the plastic by digesting it? Scientists just don't know. It's the same with neustonic life forms, says Dr. Helm. So there are some species that seem to do better in the presence of plastic. And for a long time, this really confused me. I, I knew why they were laying their eggs on plastic and they needed something hard to lay their eggs on and, and plastic just happened to be it. But I couldn't figure out if this was a new thing and they were having this like amazing boom or if this was a comeback and they were laying their eggs on something else. But an amazing paper came out a couple years ago that showed the amount of natural debris, things like large pieces of wood that has, is entering the ocean is, is a fraction of what it used to be. I mean, it may be down by over 99%. So they're using this plastic perhaps in part because there's no longer much wood out there. So it's hard to know if these animals are negatively impacted by plastics, if plastics may be a, an imperfect and really kind of sad substitute for something that used to be there, or if they're sort of adjusting to something new. 
or if, if plastics may be harmful in some ways, and we just don't know. So this brings up the obvious question, should we clean it up or not? This is hard to answer in part because we don't even know how much garbage is really out there. It's estimated that by 2050, somewhere between 155 and 265 million metric tons of garbage will have entered the ocean. But at this point in time, scientists have only ever found hundreds of thousands of metric tons in the ocean. That amount accounts for less than 1% of all the plastic ever thought to have entered the ocean. So where is the 99% of the missing plastic? Scientists believe much of it gets degraded into microplastics, which get mixed into the sea floor or make their way into the bodies of ocean organisms. Other trash sinks to the deepest parts of the sea. Scientists know that the largest concentrations of garbage are found in gyres, but even these concentrations are nothing like what most people picture. The gyres cover a huge area, and the trash is very dispersed, says Dr. Helm. It's not this floating patch of trash that you can see from space. Nothing like that at all. In fact, if you were on a boat looking out at the garbage patch, it looks like beautiful, pristine ocean. It's only when you look more closely that you realize something's a little bit unusual about this particular spot. So it's not a singular dense barge of trash, but what is out there can still cause great harm to ocean life. One of the biggest problems are lost or discarded fishing gear called ghost nets that continue to do what they do best, trap and tangle wildlife, like sharks, whales, and turtles that may be passing through. There's also a risk that the degrading plastic will release chemicals into the water and hurt the animals. But any effort to clean up the plastic with huge, scooping nets will also endanger Neustonic life because researchers have found that the highest density of animals is positively correlated with the highest density of plastic debris. And if Neustonic species are killed in large numbers, it could have an impact on the turtles, fish, seabirds, and other animals that eat them. Plus, plastic might even be helping some species that lay their eggs on the plastic. So if scooping the plastic out of the ocean is a risk to sea creatures, what do we do instead? So I have some colleagues that think we should just leave it because it's already in the environment. And they have a good point that when you throw something away, you kind of give up ownership of it, right? I mean, that's the whole point. And if there are other creatures living on it, which is true for almost all plastic in the ocean, there's usually something that's turned it into a home. Um, you know, who are you to go in and take it back out? I, I tend to see things uh, as a little bit more um, more about getting the most dangerous forms of plastic out in the safest possible way. So I'm a big fan of efforts to clean up large plastic debris, things like fishing gear that's been lost, which makes up the vast majority of plastic in the North Pacific garbage patch by weight. So these huge fishing nets, I mean, they can weigh over a ton and they are designed to catch and kill marine life. And they're designed to stay in the ocean for long periods of time without degrading. And so they're really dangerous to a lot of animals in the ecosystem. And they're actually really effective ways to remove ghost gear that don't involve yet more net. Some organizations will give GPS trackers to sailors so that they can tag large pieces of debris when they come across them. And then all those tagged bits of trash can be collected later. Another possibility could be using certain species of bacteria that actually eat and digest plastic. In fact, those bacteria might be one explanation for all the missing plastic in the ocean. Still, we probably shouldn't flood the open ocean with tons of new bacteria in hopes that they'll take care of our garbage. We need to find some way to get all that trash out, but we have to take into consideration which organisms we might be hurting when we do so. It's commendable what initiatives like the Ocean Cleanup Project are trying to do, using huge nets to scoop out tons of plastic from the garbage patch. And they say they're aware of the potential harm to ocean life and that they've adapted their design of its plastic catcher to allow species to swim away. But that's just the problem. Many Neustin can't swim away. 
and they've started scooping the plastic before studies have shown that there is no impact on the Newston. Many scientists simply wish for them to slow down and wait for more data to guide any massive cleanup effort. The ocean cleanup's other projects, like the river interceptors, are likely to be much more important in the future of the ocean anyway, preventing much of the trash from flowing out of the most polluting rivers in the first place. Before the development of plastics, Newston might have been one of the types of life that were least impacted by human activity, because they're just so remote. That's not the case anymore, and we still don't know how fragile their habitats are. The solutions aren't as easy as just collecting the trash, but maybe by studying the creatures who live amongst it, we'll better understand how to help them and clean up our mess at the same time. Our relationship with the ocean is an endlessly complicated one. And while nudibranchs may never be able to take revenge on us for messing with their habitat, some of their ocean brethren already are, as we talked about in our last video. Orcas seem to be letting us know that they are tired of our nonsense by ripping boats apart in the North Atlantic. It feels like our relationship with these creatures, and perhaps all ocean creatures, is reaching a crisis point. But it doesn't have to be this way, and it certainly wasn't always this way. And in fact, at one point in history, in one specific place, orcas and humans weren't at odds with each other, but rather were allies friends, and even business partners. The Orcas of Eden worked alongside humans for decades to hunt baleen whales off the coast of Australia, in the most incredible example ever recorded of orca-human cooperation. The combined forces of the world's top two apex predators was insurmountable, and dozens of the world's biggest animals were taken down every year. What could compel two apex predators from totally different environments to work together to achieve a common goal? How did they communicate, and how did they each keep up their end of the deal? This story of the Orcas of Eden is so incredible that I made another full-length video about it that you can watch now on Nebula. Here's a quick preview. Once the bloody hunt was complete, the men would leave the carcass anchored in place and let the orcas have the first go. The orcas ate the lips and tongue of the baleen whales, then the humans returned to harvest the rest of the body for its oil. This exchange was known as the Law of the Tongue, and it continued for decades, through multiple generations of the Davidson family. Among the most famous and recognizable of the orca partners was a large male known as Old Tom. His help was so invaluable that at one point when George Davidson was knocked out of a boat during a hunt, Tom circled him in the water, protecting him from sharks, until he was retrieved by the other humans. But sadly, the partnership was doomed to meet an untimely end. Nebula is a streaming platform that we built for exactly this reason. To explore topics more deeply, sometimes in new formats, and sometimes within subject areas that don't exactly fit our main YouTube channel. This video about the Orcas of Eden mixes history with science, but it's a topic I simply could not resist making a video about. Nebula allows me to take risks like this and experiment more. Whether it's this historical orca video, or the Nebula original series I made called Becoming Human, about the incredible story of how we came to understand human evolution. Nebula is a place for all of its creators to make experimental and new content, like Joe Scott's Mysteries of the Human Body, which takes you through some of the most baffling diseases and epidemics from history or Wendover Productions' Extremities, which shows you why and how people live in Earth's most isolated and extreme settlements. Nebula has even produced a feature-length film called Night of the Coconut, and a genre-bending, award-winning play called The Prince, which you can watch in its entirety on Nebula. You can also watch our next video now on Nebula, about the biggest tornadoes in history two weeks earlier than you can see it on YouTube. And now, if you sign up with the link below, subscribers also get access to classes. You can watch dozens of in-depth classes of creators teaching you how to create. So if you sign up using the link below, you can support this channel directly and get both Nebula and Nebula classes for 40% off the annual plan, 
for just $30 for the entire year.